that tincture, a couple of orderlies would hold in place in case of movement. We're going to get started. And the first thing that they would have used was this right here, the petite screw tourniquet. Now that's invented in the early 1700s by a French physician, Jean-Louis Petit. It really revolutionized surgery. They're going to affix that over the affected area about four fingers away from where the incision would be made. They pull that strap as tight as they could, and then you're turning the screw at the top to its tightest point. So it's cutting off circulation, it's compressing the area. No matter how much you might have struggled, it's not going to go anywhere. With circulation cut off, we are going to start with the actual cutting. They're using this right here. It's a uh, capital knife or an amputation knife. Now the function of this is to separate soft tissue from the bone. They're performing something called a single flap incision. So what they're going to do is start here, go around at an angle, and meet that beginning point. That's done very, very quickly in a circular motion. Trouble now is you've got excess soft tissue that's still going to need, be needed later. What they're going to do is pull that up and away, and the orderly would hand them a leather strap just to hold that in place with. With that out of the way, we're using another knife, and this is called a Catlin knife or a Catlin blade. Now you'll see with this one, it would have been sharp on all sides. This was used to cut away the uh, interosseous ligaments between the two front bones of the arm. Those can be tense, stringy. You don't want those getting caught in the serrated edges of the bone saw. And I do have some good news involving the bone saw, but it's as good as it can be in this situation. The good news is the fact our surgeon's also very skilled. He's going to take great care as he does this. There's quite a bit of tension between those two front bones and the arm. Understandably, you don't want those to crack or splinter. If he's a very skilled surgeon, he's going to take great care, but he's going to be pretty quick about the whole ordeal. On average, for a skilled surgeon, it was only about 30 to 60 seconds before that arm was severed. And once the arm is off, we're going to give that to the chaplain who's on site. He's going to bless the arm. He's going to take it to be buried on consecrated ground. Now, the Spanish, very highly Catholic, you okay so far? <laughs> Just let me know if you need anything. Okay. Okay. The Spanish are very highly Catholic, and they hold all body parts with great respect. So arms, legs, even fingers and toes were blessed and buried on consecrated ground. And that's done because they have a belief at the time that if you died and your entire body wasn't buried on consecrated ground, let's say you had an amputation in life, you may not reunite with that to live in the afterlife. Understandably, they do not want that happening. So they tried very hard to meet the spiritual needs of the soldiers as well as the physical, very important to them. So arm is off, the bleeding does still need to be controlled. And that is where this came in. And when this is called the tenaculum, and as you'll see, that's small and hope like with that point at the end. Now, what they're doing with this, and I get a little graphic here, so I apologize in advance. They're having to go down into the stump, and they're drawing the arteries to the surface, tying those closed with a strong silk ligature, so it's controlling blood flow and pressure. You do still have smaller veins and vessels in the arm, not quite as much pressure with those. And in that case, they're using a cautery iron that's been preheated until it's red hot. They're going to cauterize those smaller veins and vessels closed. And so now bleeding is controlled. They remove the tourniquet, not the leather strap. First, what they're doing is applying something to that surgical site known as a lint mixture. And a lint mixture is a bit like a hemostatic that would be today. It was made up of grounded flour, grounded cotton. They're going to pack that very liberally to the surgical site. What it did was it helped promote healthy drainage from the area. It also coagulated the arteries. Eventually, what happens there is the soldier's body absorbs that grounded flour and cotton and breaks it down. So they apply that, they remove the leather strap, reapproximate the soft tissue over the stump, and we're just going to close that up. But they're not using sutures, which I know sounds strange by today's standards as well. They do have suturing at this period, but it came down to being more of a preference, and a lot of colonial surgeons, particularly the Spanish, dislike it. You had a higher rate of infection setting in afterwards. So an alternative, many of them were using basically adhesive strips. And those were made with strips of silk or linen and something called isinglass. What that was was the purified air bladder of a fish, usually fish like sturgeon. What you got from that was a very sticky, almost jelly-like glue substance that when you paired with strips of silk or linen, you basically had the butterfly band-aid of its time in a sense. So they're going to seal up the stump with the isinglass adhesive. They follow that up with nice, fresh, clean linen wrap. They're going to bandage him tightly. They're going to give the soldier a sling. They're going to give him a bed to rest in. It was common practice to keep a soldier here as long as they thought was necessary until he had recovered from that injury. 
Now, how long that may have taken, it does vary with each patient. So really, the best estimation I might be able to give you is that it would take longer for one patient to recover than for another. Surgery itself did not take very much time at all. For an arm amputation, from start to finish, it only took about two to three minutes. For a leg amputation, closer to four to six minutes. Um, they're moving quickly. There is a good chance the patient can go into shock from the pain. They don't really have means of treating that, so really they're just moving as fast as they possibly can. So in a nutshell, that's an arm amputation at the colonial era. Everybody's okay so far, right? Are these replicas or are these? Um, what we have on the table for the most part, except for our little blood lens that Kate will point out at the end, are replicas. That's just because we don't want to hurt the tools themselves. We also don't want to hurt ourselves. Uh, you may see the capital deck, the doctor's office, still very sharp, so you went into that. So these four demonstration purposes are replicas, but they are based off of several models of that time period, so you get a good idea. Any other questions about it? Okay, and everyone's good, right? Okay, great, because I'm about to talk about another method of amputation. Um, I mentioned fingers and toes also being buried on consecrated ground, so of course that stands to reason digital amputations were taking place. Those can be done in a very similar fashion. Again, though, it's about preference, and there's an alternative method of amputation at this period, still around today, known as the uh, guillotine method of amputation, which is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, while that could be done with limbs, they did prefer it with digital amputation. So you have a soldier coming in, you cut his finger badly, it is showing signs of infection. What they would do is have him come in, he'd probably get a lesser dose of that tincture, he's gonna place his finger down on a steel anvil like this one, and then what we're using is one of these, and what this is is an osteotone, uh, as you'll see. It is a curved chisel, so I'm sure you know where this is headed, unfortunately. Uh, what they're going to have to do is place that at the joint of the finger, and in this case, there is more of a chance he's awake than with the arm amputation. So we're going to give him a distraction beforehand, so I don't know. Hey, look over there. I'm sure it was better than that. Don't worry. Uh, once he was sufficiently distracted in some way, what they're going to do is give that two to three solid blows. Fingers should come off. It's going to be cauterized, or they may use the lint mixture icing glass piece of method. They're going to bandage him up. They're actually just going to send him right on his way. That one was considered an outpatient procedure by today's standards. So he could go home afterwards, back to the barracks, 